Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully we're well rested. Um, welcome to the Financing Change, Collaborative Approaches to Philanthropy session. Um, I've got a couple housekeeping remarks and then I'm gonna turn it over to our fearless moderator. Um, please, everyone, uh, silence your cell phones if you could be so kind. Um, we're going to have an opportunity for um, some uh, question and answers from the audience. For that, that part of the session, please wait for the microphone before speaking. We are filming this session, and so they won't be able to hear you um, without the microphone. Um, and then you'll, if you look in front of you, you have um, sort of square papers and pencils. After the session, if you could please just take a few seconds to complete the session survey um, and hand it to a steward on your way out the door. Um, I, I'd like to kick us off, if, if, um, if you would allow me, with a, a reference back to 2008 um, and an MIT article that Sally Osberg, um, School Foundation's uh, president and CEO, wrote entitled, Framing the Change and Changing the Frame. Um, in this, she spoke to the power of strategic partnerships calling them the coalitions that take the solutions social entrepreneurs envision and bring them to scale. And she called for a new model for social change, um, one which values the power of the ecosystem and smarter, broader collaborations. Um, it won't come to any surprise to you that social entrepreneurs agreed, and in fact, we're already sort of working towards um, this ecosystem-oriented approach and, and working in partnerships and coalitions. And um, today, we're here to talk about how philanthropy can uh, catch up with those fearless leaders. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Heather Grady, the Vice President of Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors to moderate the session. <coughs> Heather. Thank you, Liz. And good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to have you all here. Um, I know there's a lot of competition from other sessions that are also really excellent, but I think you'll find our panelists are, are an amazing group. Um, let me just um, introduce them, I think, to start with. Um, first is um, Tam Nira Nandi in the middle in that beautiful orange <laughs> outfit. She is uh, the founder and a partner at DASRA, which is a leading strategic philanthropy organization in India that shapes the process of social change by forming partnerships with funders and social enterprises. Um, she has also incubated something called the DASRA Social Impact Program, enabling over 500 social organizations to receive over $40 million US in funding over the past 14 years. And every one of them that I introduce has a long, long list of accomplishments. I'm just choosing a couple. To my immediate left is Rukmini Banerjee. She is the CEO of Pratham, which is a world famous organization in India. Um, she has extensive field experience in program implementation in rural and urban areas and is also very strong in research. She has been there since 1996, I believe, so over 20 years. Um, she also led something called ACER, Annual Status of Education Report, that effort for 10 years in India. Um, on the far uh, next over is Olivia. Olivia Leland is the founder and CEO of CoImpact. Um, she has spent the last three years building that. It's a global collaborative um, to align philanthropy, social change leaders, and large-scale change. And she also serves as a managing director at the Rockefeller Foundation, focusing on bringing collaborative approaches to the foundation's initiative. Olivia was also one of the creators of the Giving Pledge with Bill and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett. And finally, on the far left is Rebecca Oni. She is the co-founder and CEO emerita of an organization called Health Leads. It's a social enterprise that was designed to, um, to address a blind spot in the US healthcare system, which is that so many people who have health problems, it stems from environmental and social causes. Um, she also, by the way, uh, received a MacArthur Genius Award. So you can see we have just a very distinguished panel today. Um, I want to just start by saying, talking a little bit about the title of this session, um, Financing Change, Collaborative Approaches to Philanthropy. It's got a bit of a sub-theme around systems change. We want to see what happens when funders of different sizes uh, combine their funds and their efforts, their non-monetary support as well, to advance positive systems change. We're going to hear not only about the opportunities, but about many of the barriers and challenges that these organizations have faced, and also hear about nascent collaborations that some of you may be interested in joining. 
I also want to just read the definition um, that the Skoll Foundation uses. They talk about the term equilibrium change to describe their approach. They support social entrepreneurs who are creating innovative models to drive equilibrium change, the disruption of social, economic, and political forces that enable inequality, injustice, and other thorny problems to persist. And I want to mention that um, a report that my organization, Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, and the Skoll Foundation put out last year with a group of others, the Ford Foundation, Draper Richards Kaplan, and Porticus, um, working with many different organizations to see what really can help funders work more collaboratively together to help scale uh, impact and create real systems change. Um, so without further ado, I, I think I'll start with the questions. Um, I'm going to start with um, Rukmini. So Pratham, as I mentioned, it's a world-renowned organization. Um, you've stood the test of time. Um, you've both scaled your impact, and I think you remain very close to communities. I think everyone knows there's a theme here this week at this forum about proximity. So sometimes organizations might be at risk of losing that proximity as they scale. So can you tell us a little bit about how you think about shifting systems? What kind of systems change Pratham has been involved in? And what has been the role of funders, either in a positive or negative way, in, in causing that? Um, <clears throat> I think the word systems change uh, is a word that's used a lot in forums like these. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, that's a good thing. Um, and uh, for the last two days, I've been thinking about, uh, you know, what we do. Is it systems change or is it just we, we do what we do? Uh, when you work with, uh, with uh, kids in primary school, uh, although we've spent 20 years, I think, working on only one or two issues, having children in school and having them learn at least building their foundations, basic reading, basic math. But I think once you do that or anything, you're going to have effects on a whole set of other things, some of which are intended and some of which uh, may not be intended. And I think that the more we have pushed on the edge of how can we do this, how can we do this faster? Because if kids don't have their basic foundations in place quickly, they're losing time, uh, their families are losing um, opportunity, uh, and the system, this amorphous thing called system, <coughs> uh, is in danger of becoming stuck. Uh, and I think that uh, in, in the process of trying to do these things, you know, maybe faster, maybe deeper, maybe better, you are in hitting on different parts of you know, what makes all of this work. And so people talk about systems change as, I think, you know, the way, let's say, a school system works. But I think of that as more as how do you changing norms in a society? Mm -hmm. how, and I think we've seen a lot of examples of norms changing. Today in India, as compared to maybe even 15 years ago, you don't have to talk to people about the need to go to school. The whole thing has changed such that now if somebody doesn't go to school, it's an anomaly. And that involves, I think, a large scale shift in mindset and in priorities of people. Now, I don't know if that is systems change or not, but I think that's a necessary part of really shifting a big. So for us, we feel that every child in the world has a very good chance to learn how to read and to do basic math, and which is also a short form for being able to stand on their own feet and take the next step towards learning. And I think you have to move everything else out of the way to make this happen. <laughs> Great. Now, one of the um, aspects people talk about in systems change is that there has to be collaboration. Collaboration across institutional sectors and silos, collaboration between funders and grantees. Can you say just a little more about co how collaborative um, it's been? Um, do you have your funders collaborating with each other? So I would say before. Let me first talk about collaboration and then about financing. So the biggest changes, I think, at least in the world that I know, which is education or schooling or learning, is when parents and teachers can actually work in the same direction in favor of the children. And that's a kind of collaboration that needs to exist in, you know, in wherever you're working with kids. Very often school systems have high walls and illiterate parents can't really engage. So how do you create platforms, how do you create places where people who care about these children can come together? So that's at, a, I would say, at a community level. 
uh, very often I find now when people talk to us about schooling, they just assume that everything needs to happen inside the school. I think the big things happen actually in the community, in the environment, in the air, and then they move into this tight thing called an institution, which is a school. In terms of financing, you know, we've, we are uh, supported and have been supported over time by many people. Some have come together to support us and some will support us you know, independently. So we have, for example, a big pool of uh, funds that we, have, we get and we've gotten for a long time from people of Indian origin who uh, live in the US. Now, is that collaborative or is that independent? But it's people who are putting their uh, individual money into a big pool. And some of that money could be $100 and some of it could be a million dollars. But I think that this coming together to support a bigger cause to me is a very big, you know, is a big model of collaboration. <coughs> and the way that they raise the money also is quite collaborative. There's a large number of volunteers in different parts of the US who, you know, mobilize their friends, their community uh, to put money in. So to me, it looks like while, you know, two big foundations coming together is collaboration. Uh, and you know maybe that's hard to do, but this building of a platform on which many people can come together to support a common cause, I think is you know an even more sustainable uh, collaboration. Great, thank you. And I think uh, that leads very well into <laughs> my next question to Nira. Dasra was formed, I think, specifically because you saw a lot of fragmented efforts uh, in India a lot of different philanthropists, a lot of different types of funding, a lot of great organizations, but not enough of a, of a maybe connective tissue that was really able to help organizations scale the way they needed to. So just talk a little bit, not everyone in the audience will sure. know what DOS is, so talk a little bit about it and then how you did that. Sure, sure. So. So we started 18 years ago, and it, uh, I wasn't as in, insightful at the time, and it was very simply, I felt like I didn't have a whole lot of skills necessarily to do the great kind of work that Rukmini and Pratham do to be in the community or actually have enough of a pile of cash to actually give to the nonprofit. So we ended up situating ourselves in the middle between where the funding is and what the nonprofits needed, but very much being driven by how could we support these organizations in achieving scale. Uh, and impact is still at the core of what, what we try to do. And so with that mission, we realized, you know, A, there isn't enough funding that's funding these organizations in an unrestricted way. So how do they invest in themselves to actually be able to scale and how do we provide that kind of flexibility? Because we realized that for them to scale, they'll need some support around basic management kinds of things. And that was really kind of the perspective that we were coming um, from having been in investment banking for, in, for a few years, it was just more of that perspective. And then very quickly we realized you can give all the advice to the organizations, but if you don't provide that flexible funding, then what's the point? And so that's when we about 15 years ago started what are called giving circles. And in the simplest way, we created a mechanism for philanthropists to pool funds and we realized to be research led. So in India, we have three million nonprofits, so it's very difficult to navigate through. Uh, and so it ended up being a bit of an excuse as to why philanthropists or people with wealth or people who want to give didn't want to give, saying everyone's corrupt and there's no good NGOs. And so we said, well, here are some great NGOs, but also the context of how they're situated in that particular issue. And then pooling funds and then supporting that organization. And then we take you know, a little bit of funding to sort of provide that capacity building. So we did that for you know, about 15 years and then realized about three or four years ago that you can support a nonprofit and help that nonprofit scale. But ultimately, how are you going to move on a sector? And, and how, in an aggregated way, do we collaborate with sort of a sense of urgency that Rukmini was talking about? And that's why about last year, about a year and a half ago, we launched what's called the 10 to 19 uh, Adolescent Collaborative. And there were a couple of learnings from having pooled this fund. It's, we call it an outcome-led fund. Uh, and what we wanted to do here was we found that NGOs labeled themselves, right? Like education, health, I'm, a health edu I'm a health organization, I'm an education organization. And so not only NGOs label themselves, but funders label themselves. And so how are you gonna actually have systemic change 
you know, as you've described it, or holistic change, if you can't bring the different kinds of funding together, give the flexibility to the organization to have comprehensive programming, and allow them to innovate to ultimately sort of achieve these outcomes. And so starting to think about initially with adolescent girls, what could be systems change for that, we realized to empower an adolescent girl, and we did a bit of research uh, with Bridgespan, and what really helps in some of the systems change and bringing about collaboration is really focusing on a few outcomes. And so in the 10 to 19 collaborative, through some research, we realized that actually if you focus on four outcomes for adolescent girls, one is delaying child marriage, uh, delaying first pregnancy, keeping girls in secondary school, and increasing agency, you can really be transformational for the girl. But then you have nonprofits who actually don't, uh, don't have the flexibility to innovate across different pathways. So what we created was a mechanism where health money comes in, education money comes in, and then Dasra as a facilitator supports a group of organizations and really invests in them to really be able to, to scale is, is some way that we're thinking you can kind of overcome some of the challenges around being able to have systems change when the funding side actually doesn't quite see or call themselves uh, that. But I thought I'd leave you with a couple of other aspects that I think are really important if we want to achieve uh, collaboration and sort of move on systems change, is I think you need a facilitator, and it's not just to promote Dasra, <laughs> but um, you, know, you do need something that sits in between because collaboration needs to be facilitated. Uh, whether it's you know, supporting the nonprofits because it takes time out or building a common agenda with funders, you do need to have that sort of facilitation aspect to it. So that's one thing that I think is, is really important. A couple of other things, um, and Rukmini also spoke to this, is we just have to work towards changing the narrative. So although we may be funding organizations, if in mainstream, for example, with adolescents, you don't change some of the mindset in the community, but also through all the way through at different levels, all the way up to the government, you're really not going to see a lot of change if we don't invest in mindset, in awareness, how the media sees this. So I think starting to invest in some of that is really important. And then ultimately, and you know, this seems obvious, but it's very important in India, is you cannot achieve this without engaging with the government. And so although philanthropy in the grand scheme of the funding out there is quite small, definitely compared to the Indian government, there has to be a way to engage with the government where they see you more than just money, but they see you actually being able to uh, see if policies are working, how you tweak this, and ultimately how you integrate into the, into the government systems. And then finally, the, the last piece, and you know, everybody talks about this, but I think it's important as well as measurement. And also of what not doesn't work. And so giving an opportunity to measure, not just for the, uh, for the funders themselves, but actually more so for the organizations. And investing in capability for organizations to kind of have that feedback loop will ultimately help us sort of achieve those outcomes that I said are a bit of the North Star in systems change. Thank you. Yeah. Olivia, um, you launched Co-Impact last year. Uh, to great fanfare, I think it really struck a chord with so many organizations. It struck a chord with funders, I think even more with organizations looking for funding because it was a commitment to large-scale funding, to being in it for a bit of the long term. I don't think you're going to be giving one-year grants. I think you're looking for the long term. But tell us about, so again, not everyone will know about Co-Impact. So tell us a bit about the genesis and then what you're working on now in 2018 and maybe some of the opportunities, but any constraints that you've hit as well. Absolutely. Well, first, I just want to say how incredibly excited I am to be here with this amazing panel, um, all of whom have uh, influenced our thinking at Co-Impact. So um, it's a real privilege and honor to get to be here with all of you. Um, also, this has been an incredibly inspiring few days. Um, the Skoll Foundation and Jeff Skoll have been an incredible partner to Co-Impact. Um, and our whole reason for being is actually to support uh, the efforts that are um, are here and are talking about that work um, here. So um, I'm feeling after these few days, it's just a huge amount of inspiration. So, um, so why Co-Impact and why did this come about? So I um, had been hearing repeatedly from philanthropists around the world that there's a desire to drive large-scale change. And yet, 
the mechanisms out there to be able to do so are still quite limited. That's not to say they don't exist, they absolutely do, um, but it's limited. And so if you're looking to drive large scale change, often that means you'll need to go and develop your own large foundation. And oftentimes the efforts are really quite um, separate and siloed. And um, so I'd been hearing this through my experience with the Giving Pledge, and then was interested in going and actually listening um, to the social entrepreneurs and the nonprofit leaders as well to hear what more philanthropy really could do to drive impact. And um, so I spent a year doing that and talking to about uh, 250 people around the world. Um, and what kept coming out is exactly what um, Liz spoke about um, in her opening, which was really people have moved, and actually what Rukmini talked about as well, of there's a lot of discussion of systems change. Um, there's a real hunger to really work on systems change, and yet funding isn't there um, in adequate supply to really work um, in this way, which requires a sort of longer term um, funding, but also the kind of partnership of not just you know, um, a here you can go and scale, but really saying, okay, how can we help you to bridge the kinds of partnerships um, in order to, to drive this sort of change and also um, really kind of um, throughout the journey be with you over the longer term. And so that's how Co-Impact came about. And the, the, um, what it is is it's a global collaborative that's focused on driving systems change in the areas of education, health, and economic opportunity around the world. Where we are now is, um, as Heather said, we launched in November, um, so it's early days. We're still very much um, in the mode of, of um, you know, big ambition, and at the same time, there's a lot that we still have to learn. Um, but we're, uh, so our plans for 2018 is to start working with some of the amazing initiatives that are doing this work, um, with the goal of then making our first round of systems change grants, which are um, grants of, um, that are in five years in duration, um, between 10 and 50 million dollars each um, with uh, in, in the fall and um, the other thing that we're doing is continuing to build out our donor community um, we have five incredible core partners um, and uh, we're continuing to build out that group as well as um, uh, engage with others um, around co-impact as well uh, and then the other thing that we're doing is talking with efforts like Dastra and learning from what are some of the other efforts that are trying to do some of the same things that we're trying to do um, and learning and exchanging and seeing seeing how uh, we can actually have more, because we will only be really one piece of this question. And there's a movement, I mean, it's so incredibly exciting that I think we are at a moment where funding can move in this direction. I think there's real appetite um, all around to do that. And the way that we'll make that happen is by coming together, realizing what we can learn from each other, what we don't know, uh, so that we don't all make, this, make the same mistakes, but also then we really um, can, uh, can come together to have more impact, and then so that we see more kinds of efforts that really are around driving systems change in a really meaningful way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Rebecca, um, you, your, uh, your organization that, that you uh, founded was one of the organizations featured in our Scaling Solutions report last year, and I certainly learned a lot from, from interviewing you and from your experiences. So you jumped into the U.S. <coughs> healthcare field, which everyone has to admit is very fraught with problems. Um, can you talk about how, um, a little bit more about that process, and I know you want to show us one slide that kind of illustrates that. Um, and maybe some of the um, funder experiences that you had, um, and then also with what you're doing now, um, and how does that relate to this conversation today? Sure, thank you. Um, you know, before I, I talk about health leads, and I think we've had some really powerful learning about when this goes well and when it doesn't, um, I was actually um, thinking about some of the photographs that Sally Osberg showed I remember it was yesterday or the day before, and um, you know so those are like some of my favorite photographs, right? The, the photograph of Rosa Parks looking out the bus window, um, Martin Luther King at the march on Washington, and you know I was thinking about um, how little time we have, how you know Martin Luther King <laughs> began his work in 1955, and within 13 years would be assassinated. 
and yet still in that time did more around issues of racial equality in the United States than probably the prior three centuries. And I was also thinking about, you know, what if King had spent 18 months every three years in due diligence? <laughs> <laughs> But, but, but I actually think this is a really important point because I've spent 18 months every three years in due diligence, and I'm sure a lot of us in the room have done this. And I, I was thinking about, you know, um, what if that had meant that he had spent 50% of those 13 years proving to people that he would have an impact instead of having an impact? And, you know, what would due diligence look like on Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks? Like, what would have funders <coughs> asked to see? What would the metrics have been? How would they have been, how would they have structured their grant reporting requirements, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, it's both kind of like an absurd thought experiment, but, you know, I'm not MLK and I'm not Rosa Parks, but I, um, I dream of having the impact that they had. And um, I want to bring health and justice to communities in the United States. And, um, and I think about how, you know, in this room, there are just, like, there are the revolutionaries of our generation. And, you know, these folks are my heroes, my mentors, my colleagues, my co-conspirators. And, um, you know, and I've just been, I've been thinking about how, like, with really a heavy heart, if our current funding norms continue to shape the way we do our work, what is possible around fundamental change? And, um, <laughs> you know, and I, and I say this from the perspective of, of my time with Health Leads, where I think I'm, I'm on this panel because um, I have had the privilege of watching funders literally throw away the playbook, and I've also witnessed funders like clutch it, I think even tighter when I come in the room. <laughs> um, and, um, and I just wanted to share a little bit of what that arc has looked like. Um, so Health Leads work is, you know, as Heather said, is fundamentally about how do we reimagine the boundaries of what counts as healthcare. You know, why is it that we have a healthcare system in the United States that doesn't account for access to food or heat or housing, these fundamentals that we know drive health outcomes. And you know, so for the first phase of Health Leads work, it was really kind of the, the brutal operational work of proving that you could integrate social needs into care delivery. What are the clinical workflows? What are the technology platforms? Who are the workforces? And um, we were privileged to be able to raise $11 million to really get the model right. And that's this uh, basically a, a period um, between 2010 and 2014. And when we got the model right, and you know, by getting it right, we began to scale. And you can see this like very sharp trajectory here basically from 2010 to 2014. And at the tail end of that period, there was a, like a really profound um, ecosystem shift in the US healthcare landscape where there was the first hints that our, our healthcare system would shift for, from basically paying for bad health outcomes like ER visits to paying for health. And our phones were literally ringing off the hook. Um, and so we like rallied and we put together a very, what we thought was a, a very ambitious growth plan, which meant we would go from 24 implementations to 80 implementations, basically like a breakneck growth speed. And um, the plan was to raise $35 million to enable this growth. And, um, and we went out and raised 20 million of it, and the idea is we'd raise the last like, leg in the first year of the plan. So, um, and 16 million of that came from Robert Johnson Foundation in a like, really kind of mind-boggling, um, unrestricted grant. So we're two months into the plan in fall of 2014, and we have this like massive oh crap moment where we realize that the market has actually like started to move so fast that like replication of our model is totally irrelevant, right? What the market really needs is for us to liberate all of the tools and insights and technologies, hard won learnings, in order to be able to enable this whole ecosystem, all of these health system actors to, to actually make this work their own, and they want it to. And so I had the um, opportunity to go back to those funders and tell them like, 
we got the whole thing wrong. So your 18 months of due diligence, like pouring over our financial projections, like everything about it was wrong. Like, and our org structure wasn't right. And by the way, this isn't really gonna be about earned revenue. And there was just this like, you know, it's like freeze frame moment where those funders had the choice to do two things. They could totally hold us to our plan or they could like abandon the whole thing with us and understand what was truly required for change. And, um, and I think it like really required us to ask each other, are we really committed to the same vision? Because if we are, we know what we need to do, but like, or are we committed to the stuff we put in like a 60 slide deck? And you know, I, I give like Robert Wood Johnson Foundation enormous credit and they moved their whole 16 million over. And with them came everybody else and we ended up raising an additional 15 million. But I think you, know, you can see one of the interesting results of this, which is that the blue line here is the number of patients we serve directly. And we looked awesome, right? This is what every funder wants. The line is going up. And then in 2015, when we made this shift, you see the number of folks we're reaching directly begins to plummet. But the yellow line is the number of healthcare institutions we were engaging, right? This is the ecosystem change. And basically, you know, our entire 20 year history, we basically worked with two dozen institutions. And last year, we were able to work with 2,300 institutions. So just, you know, what I always say is like, <laughs> you know, what I always say is like, if Health Leads were to liberate its model, our funders needed to liberate us. And they chose to do that at that moment. And, and this is what was made possible. The last thing I'll just quickly say, because Heather asked is, you know, the next phase of the work, um, I actually left Health Leads about three months ago, was recognizing that we actually have to shift the, the public discourse, the policy making, the politics, in order for that institutional trajectory to really stick in a meaningful way. And that's the next phase of the systems work um, from our perspective. Thank you. So I want to pull out a couple of strands um, from all of you and add to some of the thinking that um, we and others have been doing. We're, we have the urgency of the problems, and all of us are sitting here enjoying each other's company for three or four days, but then we go back to the reality of the enormous challenges, whether it's climate change or lack of education or gender inequality, whatever. So the urgency, and then we have the typical funder behavior and what we're trying to get to. So we're trying to get shifting the system of funding itself, looking at things like can funders streamline their processes to make it easier to, to, for grantees and investees to get funding. Can we get funders to do the collaboration, not just funders asking organizations to do the collaboration? Can we get people to think in more systemic ways, which requires longer term funding and also allowing the kind of strategy pivots that Rebecca and others have talked about and can we change the power dynamics between those who are um, providing the funding and those who are taking it? We've heard about different methods of scaling impact from our four speakers. There's scaling direct impact when an organization gets larger and larger and reaches more, um, more individuals or offers more products and services. But there are also things like uh, influencing public policy and governance, um, shifting market behavior and investment behavior, um, maybe using technological innovations or changing social norms and building social movements. So these are the, the tools that organizations use. So can the four of you, can each of you say something about what's, what have you seen, what do you think changes the mindset and actually makes funders think about what's needed, the urgency of the problem, and they actually act on, on that. Is it, is it that you're taking them and, on, on trips? Is it that you are using peer influencing and getting good funders to learn from each other? What has ever made a real difference? Um, Rebecca, let's start with you. You, you actually gave an example, um, but you, I think, are, were a very empowered um, NGO leader who got, was it luck? that Robert Wood Johnson did what they did, or is there any, what can we learn from that example that we can apply to our other work? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the things that Health Leads was always really clear on was that our work, um, that, that our goal was to change the system. And so, you know, what we would always say, internally, externally, funders, everybody, was the only two things that are sacred are the vision and the values you should expect that everything else is gonna change. And, um, you know, and I think with that clarity, you know, building relationships with funders, like, 
the conversation is really about, are we committed to this vision? And you know, there was this really like crucible moment, the one that actually changed our trajectory where you know, Health Aids had its best year ever. We had served something like 14,000 patients. We had like a 29% growth rate, like you know, everything that funders traditionally want to see. And, um, but the problem is that one in five people in the United States get care through public insurance, right, through Medicaid. And we actually visualized this. And our dot on the map was so small as to be invisible. And I think, like, that kind of speaks for itself, right? I mean, is this about the incremental next 14,000 human beings, or is this about um, redefining what our healthcare delivery system does, right? This is 19% of GDP. And I think one of the things that we just learned really on, early on is, you know, we, we ask our funders to commit with us to the ultimate impact around systems change, and we contract that we have a working hypothesis of the pathway to achieve that impact. But if that pathway adjusts, we health leads will adjust. And you know, the question is, is that, I mean, I just think this is about being fully transparent that that's the way we think about our work and our impact, and really asking folks to come with us on that. Thanks. So not every funder is going to care about systems change, um, but I think a lot of funders who come to the School World Forum do. So um, is there something in that? There's been a debate over the last few days here. Is this just another fad and more jargon and it's a bandwagon and it will come and go like so many other things have? Or is this something that can really change funding behavior if we hold ourselves to a different standard? So Olivia, what do you think? You've started out with that. Um, are, can you? Can you confirm, or maybe it's not clear yet, the funders that have come in earliest to your work, are they going to allow this kind of strategy pivot if it's needed with the grantees that you put your weight behind? This kind of renegade behavior. <laughs> I mean, I think it's really all about the impact that can be had. Right? I mean, I think that's the key thing, is what is the impact on people's lives through this work? And so, as I've had conversations both with funders and with social entrepreneurs, um, there's something that's constant across all of those conversations, which is the desire to really have a lasting impact. However you want to call it, and this is the thing that Rebecca's talking about, which is what does that mean in terms of whether it's the 14,000 or what that means in terms of sort of transforming the system over the longer term. So I think in answer to your other question, there I think it is about being able to see these examples. So see the examples of other funders also who are doing this work from around the world, which I think is also a really important piece, um, and also to be able to see the examples of where this sort of support has led to results for millions of people. Right? And I think... Um, um, that's what will actually mean whether it's something that's a fad or not. I mean, I think this point of where we are in philanthropy now is there's a real appetite to have more ways for funders to engage in the kind of work that, yes, of course, there will always be a need for also supporting also smaller scale efforts and, and direct service and, this, and throughout. But I think the other piece is saying, okay, if we're bringing together these kinds of um, collaborations that really can drive impact at a, at a really significant scale, um, and you see that funding those actually really can, can be effective, I think that's what will end up meaning that it'll stick. Thanks. Neera, in your work, so your work, you have giving circles and you have funders that are already working together. Do you see something? Is there peer leadership there? Are there funders that have maybe better practices? And also, you mentioned measurement earlier. Does, is there a difference in what's measured? So, so I don't actually think this systems change is fad. Um, I think that the complexity of solving the problems that we're all facing are, are multi-sectoral, and there is an inherent convergence of spaces that we've tried to separate that I think we're recognizing the need for all of that to somehow come together to ultimately move on on these results. So I do I do think it's important. I think I think funders have a herd mentality. So absolutely <laughs> like if co-impact comes in, you're gonna see lots of people wanting to come in, right? If uh, people are funding Pratham, lots of other people will also want to fund Pratham. <laughs> <laughs> 
So absolutely, <laughs> peers in the funding space love it. And high net worth individuals want to see the richest people and a hobnob with them to feel that they can kind of be in that club. But I also think there needs to be, and it's a bit to what I was thinking when Rebecca was speaking, is there needs to be a sense of collaboration and a collective voice from the leadership and the nonprofits on, if for lack of a better word, the demand side. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot to be as confident as you are to say, screw you, I'm not going to take your funding, right? And, and there are desperate- I didn't frame it that way. No, no, that I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, you like were a way, paraphrase. You were, you were way more articulate, and I was feeling kind of guilty. It's so true. But um, ultimately, I think what funders bet on is the leadership. Uh, and so the more we can, as an ecosystem or sector, invest in leadership to have a voice like uh, Rebecca's and to push and say, we're not going to be able to solve this problem. I'm not necessarily an education organization. This is how you know, we're approaching the problem. I think giving that uh, voice to the leadership is really Im important. And I think funders are looking to be educated. So coming with research, coming with understanding the root cause of the problem, what are you learning in the communities? What's working, what's not? I feel like there is more than ever a sense of openness for, for funders to really figure out how do they get to kind of the, the root cause of the problem. And that's part of why I'm saying measurement is important. I, I, I want to be careful because I think we're all also in this crazy evaluation world and then we spend ridiculous amounts and then funders don't really want to fund it or they fund it for themselves and so what's the point of it? I, I would encourage us to just measure for our own learning and to just be comfortable and confident that you're making a difference. And to ultimately, are you changing lives? And don't get confused by you know, these big numbers and necessarily aggregation. But if you can really <coughs> be able to say that this kind of an intervention ultimately changes lives, then that can help government, that can help policy, that in and of itself, I think, has ability to scale. Thanks. Brooke Meany, what about you? What are your reflections on this question? And are your funders the way? <laughs> no, so I'm, I'm listening to all kinds of strategies that I should <laughs> So when I go back and people say, what was the impact of the Skoll Forum? I can say at least a couple of things here. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, you know, as I'm listening to, I mean, I keep thinking that this funder isn't some other kind of creature. I mean, yes, <laughs> she or he has a lot of money, but no, they're people too. And so, <laughs> and so I think the fundamental question is, how do you carry people along? How do you convince a broad cross-section of people about what you're doing is so important that they need to jump into it as well? And I think we've learned a lot and, you know, uh, what is it? I've heard this word here, Chatham House Rules, so don't quote me outside huh. this. I mean, money is a very good thing and you can do a lot of things with money, but you don't always have money. So what is it that you really wanted to do? What is it that Martin Luther King wanted to do? What is it that Gandhi wanted to do that they would do anyway? Okay. And you have to have the power of that idea to carry people along. And so I think that you know, when money is available, it allows a lot of things that perhaps you couldn't do otherwise. But the core has to be such that a lot of people think it's important and can participate. And I think we've learned quite a bit, both from failures as well as you know, things that have gone well, is that the simplicity of what, I mean, and also I'm in education and I'm in primary education. It'll be different in health or in climate change, so I'm not sure this cuts across sectors. But if I keep things, what you have to do simple, if it's a totally different way of tackling a problem that wasn't done before, then the absorption of that into different types of settings is easier. So in about uh, <clears throat> 10, 15 years ago, we could see our tagline is, every child in school and learning well. And more and more children in school were in school in India. But everybody had this discomfort that things aren't as good as they ought to be now that all children are in school. But you didn't quite know what that was. And we could see that unless, and you know, with, when you worked in communities, you worked with kids, you worked in schools, you could see that it was really some fundamental obstacles. If you can't read, for example, you really can't do anything else. And so, it is important for kids that by a certain age to learn how to read because that then unlocks a big potential to do more. And you know, teaching children to read is not like some major health problem. I mean, many people can help to do this if they know what to do. 
So I think that we did two things simultaneously, and I'm not sure how self-consciously, you know, how strategically we were doing it then. They just seemed the two obvious things to do. One was how do you make this problem that children are in school but they're not learning very obvious to many people. Mm. So we did, we have this very simple assessment and unfortunately my bag is over there, otherwise I'd show it to you right now. And it's incredible how no matter where you are, at a bus stop in India or in the stage and school forum, you always need that little piece of paper to show what you do. So it's a, it's a, it's a simple <laughs> assessment. It's a simple assessment of can you read? Few letters, words, a little paragraph and a story. And we use this, it's called the Annual Status of Education Report, but what it is, is helping everyone uncover the problem. And right from the first day, and I remember that we decided, it just, it, it's a good story now, it, we, it so happened we did it that day. Uh, it was 2nd of October when we decided as an organization that we should do something across the country to help uncover this. Mm -hmm. 2nd of October happens to be Gandhi's birthday. Mm -hmm. It's also a holiday in India, why, which is why you had time to think. But it's a good story now when you say it. You know, it makes you feel Gandhian or something. Uh, <laughs> and it was October, and we didn't have any money put aside to do a, a, a survey across 600 districts of India. But we thought it was a really important thing to do at that time. And so what do you do when you don't have money, but you have a big ambition and a big desire? You have to convert people in whatever way you can to participate. And I think that was one of the things that really helped we understood the problem, we had a, we had a kind of a uh, estimate of it, but that was not enough for us. It needed everybody in India, and it needed, we've done this thing over and over again, 10 years, 12 years, for the problem really to settle down. And that one survey that we do every year can't be too expensive, because what if there's no one to fund it next year? Mm. You know, this is showing a country that we are not doing as well as we think is sometimes not popular, you know, understandably. Uh, and so I think that was one thing. And then coming up with a solution to solve the problem that we were seeing in a way that, you know, volunteers in the community could do it, moms could do it, teachers could do it was also equally important. So I would say I'm not aware of which funder we took to show what, but I think when you do something like this and it seems like you know, the right thing to do at the right moment, you know, many people come on board. And, you know, governments will come on board. They sometimes don't like your assessment, but they like the solution. Sometimes people like, you know. But I think that investing in understanding the problem from a different angles and making sure that what you're doing is not so complicated that, you know, you need a PhD to explain it to anybody, you know. <laughs> so I think keeping things simple, keeping things straightforward, keeping things not expensive allows according to me, allow scale in the context in which we are. I don't know what scale would mean in America, but at least that's, that's what I think. Thanks. Can I just add one quick yeah. thing on this point? And, and I think there's this really interesting kind of dialogue here around <clears throat> the chicken and egg of the funders and those doing the work and how do we mutually commit to this? Um, so that chart that I showed, um, actually got published about two months ago in Health Affairs, which is the like, main poli health policy journal in the United States. And one of the things that I wanted to do was publish it with one of our funders to really have memorialized, this is what it looks like when you enact this kind of throw out the playbook funding. So the article got published and um, you know, it's a 20 year case study of the sort of triangulation between health leads, the market, the, the healthcare sector, and, and the role of philanthropy, which has been clutch. And, um, you know, I, it, it's like, you know, it's gotten some attention, but I, I was like, why isn't this being, like, systems change, philanthropy, why isn't this getting talked about more? So I called, you know, one of the folks who, um, who, you know, had been kind of a thought partner to me on the article and, and, you know, who's been in philanthropy for a long time and said, like, what's the deal? Like, it's not getting tweeted, no one's talking about this. And she was like, as though I was a small child, was like, See, nobody wants to talk about this, Rebecca, because you were the exception. Health Leads was the exception. And like, no funder wants people showing up being like, we got the wrong strategy, like shift your, you know, 20 million this way. And I think it was just a really, like I think I had genuinely believed that if we documented the story of systems change philanthropy and really showed the chart, right, that that would be catalytic in a way. And to hear like, no, like this is actually, like this is high risk behavior on the funder side that we actually wanna like tamp down this 
this, this documentation, I think really sobered me around, you know, what are, the, what are the dynamics in this ecosystem and how do we think about unlocking them? So we have sort of varying levels of optimism across the panel. I think we're all optimistic, but maybe more cautious than one another. Okay, we have time for some questions. So raise your hands high. We have some mics. It's hard for us to see up here. Okay, how about this uh, person, one, two, three, in the fourth row with the suit? <laughs> Thank you. I'm Tim Wainwright from WaterAid. I thought it was a really interesting discussion, and I don't think it's a fad, actually, either. Um, and in other sectors, they talk about agile programming and so on, which is similar. And Rebecca, I, I loved your story and slide. Um, uh, so I work in water sanitation and hygiene. Long-term sustainable systemic change is impossible without full engagement of government, local government, national government, high-level political leadership. So I just wondered if any of you had any words of wisdom to offer on how philanthropic funding can, be, um, can help to enter that mix where government engagement is essential to long-term change. Thank you. And we're going to take three questions at a time. I know there's a question down here at the front row, the woman with the blue scarf. Hi, thank you all so much. Melissa Stevens from the Milken Institute. Um, so when we think about philanthropy, it's a mechanism for families to leave their legacy in, in this world. And so my question is for Olivia. Um, if you have, uh, have you found yourself having a hurdle or expect to have a hurdle in bringing funders together to be collaborative, um, do they have a sense of losing their identity or still, how do they balance wanting to have a, a unique identity and footprint um, to, 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 to leave that? Um, and do they ever have a sense of, you know, being diluted, I guess, um, by being more collaborative with others? Okay, and how about one from this side? Any questions over here? Well, we'll take from you, the gentleman with the suit. Thanks for this um, incredibly enlightening. Can I ask whether it matters where the money comes from? Um, <laughs> the Global Fund recently disengaged from Heineken, um, a rather large partnership that was being forged um, in the wake of backlash as to what Heineken represents in the face of global health. Does it matter to organizations where their money comes from, how clean it is, and are there intermediaries that can help, um, quote unquote, launder this <laughs> reputation? <laughs> okay, let's see. How about if the first question about words of wisdom of philanthropy working with the government, maybe Nira and Rebecca, can you answer that one? Sure, so uh, I think there's many ways in India because you can't, so unfortunately I can only speak from the Indian uh, perspective, is that you can't achieve scale uh, without working with the government. There's, it's as simple as sometimes just funding nonprofits. So in India, a lot of nonprofits that are working to achieve scale will be working either through government systems or aligning with policies or availing of some sort of government scheme. So you can inherently fund organizations that have a model that already engages with the government. Interestingly enough, in the sanitation space, where we're also focused in urban sanitation, there actually weren't enough policies, whether at the city level or even at a government central level on fecal sludge management. And that's one of the biggest problems in India is sort of 70 to 80% of fecal sludge or shit basically goes into the drinking, drinking water, into the water system. And so what we did is we brought a group of organizations together as being able to advise the government on the policy, draft the policy, and do consultations. And I know they do that quite a lot in India with engaging the nonprofits on that. But what we did was build that alliance and facilitate that alliance and bring folks from different perspectives to be to be able to do that. The challenge with working with the government is the government is as siloed, if not more siloed, than the funding. And so to actually achieve some of these uh, issues, they're cross ministry as well. And so what we're seeing is helpful potentially for philanthropy to fund are these missions which bring different ministries together, whether it's the women and child ministry or water and drinking. And so creating some of these areas of convergence within the government system is also where we've seen philanthropy work. 
Thanks. Rukmini said she wanted to answer this one as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think, again, you know, unfortunately you have, um, or fortunately you have a lot of Indian voices here. We do um, have a billions of people, so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, th I think that um, the, you know, obviously, without working with government, it's difficult to really penetrate into some of the norms that we are talking about. And uh, I wanted to mention um, that, for example, the grant, we have a grant from the Skoll Foundation. And what we use it for is to be able to catalyze what happens in government systems. So that grant is, you know, compared to what the government is spending, it's a very, very small amount. We use it to spend uh, on people who will work very closely with the government. So you can think about a uh, state in India which has maybe 50 districts and all that this philanthropic money which is coming to us helps to fund is two people per district. But even that in a well-designed collaborative program with the government can lead to quite big results. So I would say that the, the way that we look upon it is that that helps us cover our costs we are very mindful that in each successive wave with the government, how do you keep your costs either at the same level while you're expanding the work that the government is going to do, or you know, if you are, uh, if you are um, um, remaining at the same scale, then how do you reduce your cost? But playing with some of this, and I think the governments in India look forward to some of these things. I think that time, uh, ideas that need to be injected into a system I think there is openness in different places for how you bring that in. And I think that's where, uh, you know, collaborations working, you know, implementers or innovators working with um, some funds of their own uh, can certainly help. Rebecca, I want you to add briefly, but then I'm going to also, I'm going to switch the question for you to ask about bad money. <laughs> Would you take money from a tainted source? You can start with a government answer. <laughs> Money yeah, laundering question. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, I mean, I think I can just answer that latter question very simply, which is no. I think it's a more complicated question of like, what's a tainted source, right? Yeah. So, um, um, so, so just on this government point, just to make this really crisp and like very concrete. So basically, from you know, I started Health Aids in 1996. And in 2016, um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the United States, which is the largest purchaser of healthcare in the entire world, um, for the first time in history, created a pilot called the Accountable Health Communities Pilot that actually paid to screen patients for their unmet social needs and navigate them to resources. But that was 20 years, right? And so, you know, I was presenting the paper at a, at a healthcare event, um, you know, with all these payers in the room and health systems providers. And, you know, they're like, yeah, 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 you know, addressing the broader notion of health, yes. Um, but, of course, like, none of them were going to pay for the 20 years that we spent, like, refining the model, testing it, failing, going back again and again. And, like, I just think it's a very crisp case study of if we had not had flexible philanthropy over a 20-year period, there would have been no bridge to government involvement. Um, and, you know, that is, that's a critical inflection point. And what's so critical is not just that, you know, the U.S. government said, okay, we're going to commit $157 million to pilot this approach and to really understand the economics of addressing social needs. It was the market signal that that created. So as soon as CMS said it was going to do that, you know, literally for the first time in 20 years, we have the largest commercial payers in the United States, insurers, calling us saying, how do we address patient social needs, right? So that catalytic effect of like true venture philanthropy, bridging to government, and then government's market signaling causing a set of private actors to begin to behave differently, like we just saw that play out directly. Thanks. Um, I don't want to uh, gloss over that question about the source of money. I think it's important because we're talking about philanthropy collaborating. So I guess let me reframe the question. If bearing in mind that it's hard to judge um, what money one might consider tainted, but let's say there were. So in philanthropy collaborations, do you think we have the mechanisms in our sector that um, if your work that, that we have, we are able to say to funders who we don't want to partner with, no. I mean, Olivia, this could come up for you very concretely, and Nira, it could come up for you very concretely. Is it something we need to yeah. think about more? Or I mean, 
I think we all do think about it. I mean, we've certainly had lots of conversations on our team about this very question, as well as with many of the donors that we've been engaging with, because especially when it does come to collaboration, it's really important to think about who you're engaging with. So both for sort of us as the co-impact team, as well as for all the donors who already are involved. Um, and I think I would broaden it beyond sort of the tainted, but it's also just thinking about how, to, how can you ensure, especially when it comes to collaboration, that people are aligned, because that's sort of one of the key points of collaboration mm -hmm. is to be able to provide that kind of aligned support. Um, so I think that's also really important. I think we have, I do think we have to be careful. Um, I think that it's difficult to know who's out there with dirty money and not. Um, I think Ruchir Sharma wrote an interesting book about bad billionaires and good billionaires and bad billionaires are the mining and oil and gas and all of that kind of stuff. And the good billionaires are, apparently are the technology and <laughs> you know, the pretty ones. But, um, you know, it's a lot of the wealthiest families and foundations didn't make money in the cleanest cleanest sure. of ways, right? Yeah. The Tata trusted opium, Rockefeller, and oil and gas. I mean, so if it's enough generations far away, <laughs> it seems to be fine. If it's, you know, Older <laughs> newer wealth, then you question. But I think it also has to do with, at least at a high net worth individual, the, the individual. And you really do need to make sure you're aligned on basic values and to the extent of even behaviors and how they come together to your question, like when, when they're all sitting around the table. So in our Adolescents Collaborative, we have USAID, Packard Foundation, SIF, uh, a UK family-based foundation. We have Bank of America. So we have a lot of different kinds of folks, if you want to call them that, coming to the table. And you do a lot behind the door because we got really screwed once where we were like, we're all happy, happy, let's all come together. And then this entire meeting exploded where people were misaligned. They were like, what's Thusra doing anyway? So we had to take a time out. So you do a lot of behind the door alignment. And so not only values and behaviors, but it's also that individual with whom you're collaborating. So you might have an institution behind them, but that person that's gonna be engaged on the relationship is actually uh, extremely, extremely important. And you also ultimately go by gut feel and trust. So I'm not sure we've talked enough about this, but ultimately you're investing or you're bringing that person and you all trust that what you're trying to achieve you know, together is really something that, that you want to do. And the, the thing that's really helped us in terms of building the alignment are the outcomes. And so if you can have that North Star and everybody's bought into that North Star, you really try and work through the conflict of the how, I think is a lot easier. Great. Olivia, I don't want to overlook the question about families that come together and maybe lose their identity through the collaborative. Um, is that something that you've um, thought about well you must have in the last many years um so yes i've definitely thought about it um so i think it's quite striking that there are lots of jokes in philanthropy about collaboration right so the sort of the okay the collaboration philanthropy is i do this you do this and this is collaboration or i won't go through them jokes jokes are not necessarily my strong suit but basically um <laughs> there are many um and as I was talking with funders in the early days of, sort of getting co-impact off the ground, one in particular said to me something which really stuck with me, which was the challenge with a lot of philanthropic collaboration is that you feel like the pimple on the tail of the dog. Which, so just, if you, I think that's very evocative. So the pimple on the tail of the dog means that you don't feel like your sort of full self, I guess, is there. But also it's because oftentimes what it means is if you need to go and give to a much larger funder, which is often the model, right, where you actually go and there's a, another funder and then you would go give alongside, that you can't bring your full self. And I think that's, that, that's where Nira's point of what role can you play where actually you do have an intermediary that can then, it's not just about the funding. So what you need to do, I think, with collaboration is actually have it so it's not just about kind of everybody pulls and then walks away, but really that you try to think about in the collaborative, what are the different things that each funder brings to the table? Mm -hmm. So it could be, and this gets to sort of the, the, the piece of, um, again, some of the other themes of um, sort of then encouraging others, right? If you, of course, it's not going to be everyone who sees this, but then if you have a few that really do see the power of coming together and can then demonstrate that it isn't just about the funding, what does each funder bring, 
then others can see that and we can start to see more collaboration in philanthropy. Um, I think one of the other things that I saw a lot through in my conversations was there is a lot of push on nonprofits to collaborate. Um, and in order for us, in, 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 we went through a lot of different names with Co-Impact, and at some point people called it a donor collaborative. And we felt very strongly that it's not a donor collaborative. It really has to be about not just donors collaborating, but sort of if, if you create the space for true collaboration, it's about the donors coming together with the organizations, with government, with really sort of all of the directors coming together towards a similar goal, or towards the same goal, um, and that that's really what you need to do in order to then see, it goes back to then being able to see the impact, um, and actually seeing also what you can bring. I mean, I do think it is challenging the systems change, both for the organizations that are involved, as well as for the funders, sometimes to be able to see that, that to, to figure out what is what you can sort of attribute in terms of when it comes to measurement. Um, and I think that's going to be something we're all going to need to learn more about um, so that we can um, really look at kind of what are some of the practices that, that various organizations have used around this as we think about um, impact across an entire system. Thanks. Um, I, yeah, I think we need to recognize that collaboration is not easy. Um, people talk about having to have trust, but sometimes people have to collaborate in cases where they're is no trust. There's a book that came out recently called Collaborating with the Enemy, How to Collaborate with People You Don't Trust, uh, Like, <laughs> or <laughs> Agree With. Okay. And I think that's important. And also, yeah. there, there's a saying. <laughs> I think it's and the, the, former the fact US. that I'm writing it down doesn't mean anything. I'm just repeating. <laughs> it's by Adam Kahan. So there you have it. Um, there's also a saying by the, I think the US, um, the former US Surgeon General that says, collaboration is an unnatural act between non-consenting adults. <laughs> and I am sure that all of us have been in that situation. Okay, we have time, I think for maybe one, one more question or two, depending on how long they are. Okay, the gentleman here. And I'd like to get someone up there, but it's hard for us there, to there see him. Okay. Sorry. Hi, thank you for an extremely interesting session over here. My name is Amir Fancy, I'm from Pakistan. I run a not-for-profit trust, which is 70 years old. My question to philanthropy over here is, um, do the funders also think about sustainability? Uh, is it just giving grants to organizations which may or may not uh, survive in the long run? Uh, we've had an opportunity after 70 years to partner with the Acumen Fund to set up a uh, for-profit, um, but for-purpose uh, enterprise for low-cost private schools. So our collaboration in philanthropy has been with not-for-profit and for-profit, uh, but for purpose. Um, is the world moving towards social finance and patient capital from just giving grants from large funders? Is that something that you look at in terms of keeping organizations sustainable and letting them grow on their own? Okay, and a question over here. Um, Rebecca, I've got a question. Uh, you got your very large support from Robert Wood Johnson. What, when you, when you transitioned from scaling programs to scaling impact, mm -hmm. what did your more traditional or your, your older line funders, how did they react? And was it good for you or a problem for you? Mm -hmm. Okay, why don't we stop there, I think, with the questions. Rebecca, why don't you answer that, and then all of us have a chance to answer that last question. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, what to say? I mean, I think that, um, I, I think there's, at that pivot moment, I think there's multiple ways that folks can struggle, funders can struggle to like cross the chasm from scaling impact to really beginning to invest in an organization or set of organizations to be able to really move systems. And I think, so, so three of those that were most omnipresent was of course first, what do we measure, right? Like rep number of patients, number of desks, number of implementations, number of clinics, super easy, right? And when we started, you know, the real thing we're trying to do is like reimagine the use of 19% of GDP in the United States. Like how do you think about measurement in the context of systems change? We've all talked about that, but I think what was critical was those funders did commit 
and, and this was important to, work, instead of pulling their funding and waiting for us to miraculously come back with metrics, they actually committed to work with us on the creation of a new set of metrics. So that was really game changing. I think the second challenge was around, which got alluded to, this issue of attribution or contribution, right? So the funny thing is, right, so like the US government says like, okay, we're gonna launch this $157 million pilot. Health Leads had nothing to do with it, to be super clear, other than we were like the model that was cited in the funding announcement. Every funder calls, did you do that? And it's like, I don't know how to answer that question, like sort of, right? And so just like, what's the way that we actually talk about what our impact has been? Um, you know, and then I think the final piece, which has to be said, is around risk tolerance. So like scaling an organization, like there's a way to think about risk tolerance and to mitigate risk. And I actually think funders are like increasingly practiced at risk mitigation in the context of scaling impact, right? And partly because they're pulling from like their venture capital days and, and other ways of thinking about due diligence, but also tracking progress over time. We just have to say systems change work is extremely high risk work, period. And, um, and we have to reevaluate the way we manage risk because it's not gonna be because the chart like goes up and up and up and over time. And so I think you know, all three of those were things that we had to spend a lot of, and I think appropriately, like a good amount of time really engaging with our funding partners around. None of them were resolved before they made this commitment, but what I did appreciate was that the commitment was to be with us in working to understand those issues. And your board was also supportive all the way through? Just, I, I, my question was carrying through with that. Was your board supportive as well? Yeah, I think, I mean, we had just, again, been always religious about this point of like, it's about ultimate impact and you have to let go of all kinds of stuff. I mean, like whatever, I had board members cry when we cut program, blah, blah, blah. But like, <laughs> bottom line is, <laughs> Are we trying to transform the healthcare system or not? And we're not going to do it in increments of like 14,000 human beings. So, you know, we kind of had to be honest about that. So we all now know working with Rebecca is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can I ask our other three panelists, we each have a minute to answer the question about sustainability. And let me just say, I think we all know we support organizations that can absorb grant capital, and that's all some that are, can take fully commercial capital and some that are somewhere in the middle on the spectrum. So can you think about sustainability in the context of donor collaboration? What are any lessons about that? Or is that a good opportunity to, to mix them within one donor collaborative? Uh, I'll say two things. Um, one is that I think the key thing and what we've been seeing through many of the, the partners that we've been working with is that the sustainability of impact is crucial and that that might also mean the organization shifting what it's doing, similar to the, the, the story that uh, Rebecca told or potentially actually no longer existing 10, 15 years if actually mm -hmm. the goals are, are accomplished. So um, I think when we're thinking about systems change, I think that's really important from a sustainability lens. Um, the second thing I would say is that similar to the question about the role that philanthropy has with government, I think we do need to be more thoughtful about the role that grant funding has as well um, as looking at other forms of financing. And um, that's something I'm particularly excited to see sort of more discussion about. I think um, in some settings we've really moved very far in the direction of saying impact investing is really the way to go. Um, in other cases, we say it's only grant funding. There needs to be somewhere where we actually really do look at when is grant funding playing a role and how can we think about blended models when it makes sense. Um, and I think that is something around collaboration as well. And, um, and also that that is a chance to then leverage. I mean, the piece we haven't talked about is, those, is this in, in, incredibly important part that philanthropy is only a tiny, tiny piece of the picture. Um, and so if we think about leveraging other funding, that's so crucial. Thanks. Nira, briefly. Yeah, I mean, I think it sounds like your question largely came from financial sustainability, which is why maybe you were talking a bit about for-profits. I, I really believe that uh, we have to look at the actual business model and then match it with the right kind of financing. And so, you know, if you are a nonprofit, you are a nonprofit because products and services mm -hmm. cannot be paid for by the ultimate consumer. Mm -hmm. And so looking at these business models and then matching it with can it take equity, can it take debt, can it take grant funding, I don't think we do actually uh, enough of that. And so for everyone to start to gravitate that the answer to sustainability are all for-profit models, mm -hmm. 
we've got way too many problems in Pakistan and India that won't be solved with, you know, just that, the Acumen Fund or funds. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Rukmini, last words for you. So, you know, the word pratha means first. So I'm very happy you're giving me the last word. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to talk about the word sustainability. It's another word that is talked about a lot. And you know, you, I think you already talked about, I think he meant financial sustainability. But as I look ahead, uh, I think about sustainability as sustainability of the idea that you're trying to push, obviously of the impact as well. And another thing that I'm beginning to increasingly be aware of, and there may be others who are far wiser and smarter who've been aware of it all along, <laughs> is that you know, we run a big organization. Uh, I mean, 6,000 full-time people, almost an equal amount of, uh, the, uh, almost an equal number of part-time people. And what I'm seeing is that this is a training ground for people who have this kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that we do enough to sustain, to build the fact that these are all long-run players in this game. Mm -hmm. Today, if I look around in India, many of the uh, education, uh, people who are doing, other organizations who are doing good work have had some roots in Pratham. And I'm not sure that I'm, we are doing enough about you know, kind of creating this cadre of can do people, will do regardless, love funders, but if they don't come along, we'll still do it anyway, kind of mentality. Don't get me wrong, by the way, everyone here. There must be lots of funders in the audience. <laughs> we love money. Um, <laughs> But I think that this, this, the stuff we are working on has, you know, needs to be pushed in many different ways in many different settings. And to me, sustaining the pressure on, you know, our families, our communities, and our systems to make sure that this is not a problem after some time needs, I think, a broader look about what sustainability is. So. Thanks. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end. I think. Our panelists have been not only amazing and thoughtful and experienced, they're also very entertaining. So thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of the forum.